The webinar today is Climate Change and Health Adaptation, Working with BC First Nations. My name is Kate Murphy, and I also have my colleague Elena Chia with me on the webinar to help with any technical issues that might arise. Hopefully they do not. I'd like to acknowledge that we in the Vancouver Fraser Basin Council office are on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I have lived and worked and studied on this territory, and originally my family is from the Netherlands and Ireland. So the webinar today is brought to you by Dr. Paivi Abernethy, as well as the BC Regional Adaptation Collaborative. This collaborative works to support local governments, First Nations, and industries in integrating climate change adaptation and preparedness into their planning and decision making. And we also have an online portal for adaptation resources, which you can find on retooling.ca. Uh, it's in the midst of a renovation. So over the next fiscal year, you'll see it be um, very shiny and new looking. Um, but I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of resources that we have on this website. First of all, being our newsletter, it sends out monthly or bi-monthly adaptation resources, funding opportunities, news, and events. And if you didn't sign up for that on your webinar registration, you can email me or access it online uh, at that button. And also our online webinar repository for all of our previous webinars. You can find all the recordings and PDFs or um, PowerPoint files on there. And this webinar as well will be hosted online so you can find it again after the fact. A few logistics before we begin, please keep your audio muted. If you have any questions, you can put them in the question box. You can see um, on this picture uh, on the control panel, you can access the question box. Uh, we'll save all the questions for the end for a Q&A period, but feel free to ask questions throughout. As well, if you have any technical difficulties, you can email fraserbasin at gmail.com or write them in the question box and Elena will help you out with that. We're very lucky today to be joined by Dr. Paivi Abernethy. Uh, Dr. Ebernethy is a climate change and health specialist with the First Nations Health Authority, a research fellow at the University of Victoria, and an adjunct professor in the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo. She has been working in sustainable, healthy community development with Indigenous and rural communities since 2005, focusing on social, ecological, and Indigenous determinants of health and community capacity building. Her work centers on impacts of various environmental factors on community and ecosystem health, ranging from climate change, pollution, and natural resource governance, particularly water, to cultural and socioeconomic influences on health. Ivy, thank you so much for joining us. I will switch this over to you so that you can begin. Thanks, Kate. And thanks, Ileana. And now I'll try to get this going. Um, Great. Thank you, uh, for um, thank you for having me and uh, welcome to everyone. I hope everybody can hear me and thanks to Fraser Basin Council for arranging this. Uh, I hope that my talk generates a good foundation for all the First Nations climate leaders in BC um, so that they can come and talk and tell their stories on this forum forum because there are quite a number of them. So um, first I wanted to uh, acknowledge the, that I uh, to start by the acknowledgement with unceded territories of Souk Nation where I'm located and I want to express my gratitude also for their warm welcome to me and my family four years ago when we arrived here. And good day to all of you. I'm not able to pronounce uh, the language appropriately here. So uh, I want to share with you first the talking points of today. And I am going to situate myself and the talk in the context of First Nations uh, uh, health in climate change context. And then there are three areas and topics that I really want to um, highlight today. One is a more holistic approach to looking at the climate change impacts on health. Uh, I want to bring about and bring attention to some indigenous climate leadership 
as well as highlight throughout the whole presentation uh, the value of strength and asset-based approaches to uh, tackling climate health issues. And when I say climate health, I mean climate change impacts of health on health. And there's a first uh, survey that I'd like to start with to have a quick poll to understand where you all are coming from. And if you I've can just, answer within, I, I, I leave this to Kate, yes. Yeah, I was just going to say the exact same thing. Uh, I've just launched it, so I'll, I'll give them 30 seconds or a minute or so. All right, so Pivy, because you can't see these results, um, the results were 42% of people have been working with First Nations communities, 19% have worked with First Nations but are not doing it now, and again, 19% want to work with First Nations, and 11%, uh, it is not related to my work, I'm just curious, and 8% working in First Nations communities. Great, so, oops, so that threw me, back to the yep so uh since most of you are working with the first nations communities i hope there is still some um additional information for you it's really challenging to um i just want to say before i said it's it's quite challenging to try to address needs of such a broad audience that some people are quite new for the topic and some people are experts on it so i hope that uh I can get something for each of you and, and, and those who are already working in the First Nations communities, I hope this will give you some useful language and tools to, to take it further. So, because of the context of my uh, current employment in First Nations Health Authority and not everybody being familiar with it, I want to make sure that uh, you you know the organization. Uh, it is very unique in Canada because normally health uh, of Indigenous people is historically funded uh, and organized directly from the federal government, whereas the rest of uh, Canadians, the the healthcare is primarily the responsibility of the provincial governments. But in BC, the First Nations came together and decided that uh, it would be more effective to, um, to have uh, a central body uh, that is or getting all the funding and then helping so the communities don't need to spend efforts and resources to applying for it uh, annually all the time. So there was, they, created these tripartite agreements between BC First Nations, the province of BC and the government of Canada and uh, are organizing various ways of trying to supporting the regional health authorities who are responsible for the primary care and public health in, in the entire province, working with them to create more culturally safe and, and uh, supportive environments and programs that are more culturally appropriate uh, in First Nations communities. And I am located in environmental health and research, environmental public health, health services. In more my context in this particular uh, presentation and in my work, it is, is it is vital to state that I am not speaking on behalf of any First Nations communities. I'm not representing them. Uh, I am a, or the one and only climate change and health specialist with FNATA. And uh, in that role, and I'm also an academic and research practitioner, researcher practitioner who is specialized in public health and sustainability governance as was mentioned. And, and in that in particular children's environmental health and chronic disease prevention, climate health, and bringing together different ways of knowing. Uh, I am originally 
a Savonian from Eastern Finland, Finsert tribal. And uh, I have worked with First Nations communities pretty much after, straight after my arrival and 2000, since 2005. I placed that picture on the side because um, where I'm from, it was traditionally asked uh, whose daughters or sons you are to help situate where I'm from. And that's a picture of me being not that very many years old. It was when I came here, it was very interesting to me to find out that it's a very common way of also situating and understanding and connecting with the social networks here with the, in Canadian context on, in, in First Nations uh, communities. But the key piece here is that my role is to help bring together different ways of knowing and to help build capacity, strengthening the existing capacities, empowering the communities to do the climate change and health work. And uh, therefore, I cannot and feel very strongly that I cannot tell the stories of the communities. I am going to mention to you various contexts and put the connections where you can find more information and whom you can connect with. But I hope that there will be presentations where people will be coming to these webinars to tell their stories. And before I start, I want to explain a little bit more what I mean, mean with um, bringing together different kinds of um, ways of knowing. Um, I want to highlight here the one of the two aspects that are critical to my work. And uh, this paper that is cited here is by Dar Dr. Darlene Sanderson, who is a Cree professor at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. And she led this transdisciplinary research together, co-led with the Latin First Nation. And there are two more points that I want to sort of bring forward here, that Western science and indigenous knowledge are very complementary in a way it's we, we, we talk about two eyed seeing or working on two feet two legs um they keep they help getting the balance showing different sides of the story and for instance western science is often limited by its hypothesis and assumptions and and uh, may miss critical aspects of the complexity that is needed to deal with complex situations like in real life, such as climate health adaptation. And indigenous worldview is much more holistic uh, and deals better with complexity. The also, I want to highlight the second part is that, that they are, it's almost like apples and oranges, is Western science offers really great tools to measure and monitor the world and help us understand what is going on in a, in a more generic whale so that we can compare across regional areas without uh, that with different in different contexts whereas indigenous knowledge is way broader than science it's more like a way it may, more it it's more like a way of life it embraces values and ethics together with the monitoring and observations and connections and to deal with climate change impacts on health we really need um, in particular in First Nations communities, but in general too, we need both types of knowledge. And the other aspect that I wanted to highlight here before I get all going on, because that explains where I'm coming from, is that strengthening the community capacity that when we are now mostly do dealing with communities in climate change adaptation, be it health or outside, we often focus on vulnerabilities and risks. And that's a quite narrow approach. And it often um, involves only a very statistic, statistic static <laughs> um, assessment of a given situation and doesn't take into account that, that things are changing and we need the capacity building to actually address the issues and it can be very paralyzing and re-victimizing victimizing for community development um, if we only focus on the vulnerabilities and deficits uh, emp empowerment has been recognized and there are a couple of studies down there in in health 
in as as the goal in itself but it's also an outcome in the terms of that when people are empowered they appear to have uh, better health outcomes and this was this is an old english study from by marmot and uh, where they were looking at the office workers and discovered that even the working conditions were very much the same people who didn't have power who felt unempowered and felt that they were just dictated things their health outcomes were significantly poorer than those who were in in a high in the higher positions in hierarchy and had better opportunities and sense of empowerment so that's sort of from the health promotion and public health perspective so before i start talking about climate change and health and and what it means and how it can be understood i have a little question here so that i don't talk too much about what is um, uh, self-evident Kate, do you take it from here? Yes, people are just voting. Uh, we have about 50% voted, so I'll leave it until maybe 10 more percent vote. All right, so the results are, um, the highest amount is some at 48%, some focus on climate change impacts on health. 27% uh, have a little focus on climate change impacts on health. 18% not at all, and 7% of folks have primary focus on climate change impacts on health. Thank you, and that's great. I mean, it's not great for our climate change health perspective because we need much more of it, but it's great for me in the terms of that I'm not telling you with something that you absolutely already know, so it's not all too boring. Um, so, to get going some more is um, it's really hard for us but to, to wrap our brains around the complexities related to climate change and health impacts because we have been trained in school in this very linear Western thinking which is rather compartmentalized we talk about religion one place science biology one place physics another place and so on and so forth. So basically, I think it's important for us to think about what is it that we're talking about. And it is the increased greenhouse gases that cause overall average temperature changes, and that in turn causes extreme weather. weather. And those are the fundamental causes. And I'd like to highlight that the CO2 so is not actually the worst greenhouse gas. But why I highlight it here is because it's so vital to climate health because it co it's causes um, or is associated with but it also causes acidification of uh, the water bodies. And um, those all those three factors are then in turn creating all these complex pathways about growth trees and changes, drought, forest fires, flooding, so on and so forth, that in turn either cause acute health problems or the part that I really would like to focus on in this talk, more of the long-term things that impact our health and can be actually much more devastating because it's changing our living conditions and, and basic aspects of our life. I, there are a lot of different kind of models for climate health impacts and I like one aspect of this BC government model, even though it's very simple, it talks about these different pathways. So it highlights the, that we need to think about the natural environment pathways, the built environments, community and social factors, livelihood factors, and lifestyle factors, because these all are intertwined and connected. And we really need the language to start thinking this way. And this model sort of helps us start developing the new tools, because as most of you probably have heard Einstein said that problems cannot be solved by the same mindset that created them in the first place. So we need to find completely new ways of talking and thinking about our health and particularly the climate change impacts on it. 
most of the conversations he, these days focus on those immediate problematic things that are associated with emergencies because they are universal and and they affect they are politically very sensitive and they often are connected with uh, um human mass tra tra mass tra tra oh sorry tragic events uh like fires and storms and i'm not going to go into these but it just highlights how there there are a number of them the two things that I thought was most interesting when I got into this was the recognition that we know more and more that heart conditions are caused and associated with these different um, climate change impacts, as well as kidney. There's, there are increasing number of studies highlighting how particularly people who have any kind of kidney challenges are, pro are having severe effects from the heat. So this is what you usually hear when you talk about climate change and health. And it's really, really important to address it. It's just not the focus of my talk today. And, and I also work with that on when I'm working as a health specialist on this. So the long-term change influences are the changes that are on the land, the water cycle, the air, the, and our food system. And they feel much less urgent and they're harder to grapple. Um, and, and truth to be said, when we start talking about them, they might feel kind of scary to even start addressing because we feel the powerlessness, but that doesn't make them to go away. And uh, we are learning now that we used to think that the forest fires, for instance, are, is a good thing for renewal of the forest. Uh, which it is when it's a controlled fire and it's in a small area as in traditional controlled fires um, have proven to be. I mean, indigenous people have used them for thousands of years uh, and now there are Western studies demonstrating both in, in northern United Northwest in Washington and Oregon and here in Interior BC, um, ADAPT funded project that show that they actually are very beneficial. But in general, nowadays, when we have these massive areas, it's showing that the forests are not recovering. The biodiversity is not there. As a biochemist, which is my very first training, I have also often thought about, about the pollution that comes out of flooding or and then the chemicals that we use to put down the fires. But that's outside of the scope of this talk. It's just something to think about when we think about complexity. But the climate change is severely impacting our ability to grow foods, food in agriculture, as well as it's impacting the way plants grow in the in the forest and and um, the whole forest season in the the growth season of, for instance, berries and the uh, pollinators. And it's it's not just the heat; it's also having suddenly frost in June when the blooming is happening and then there are no pollinators and so on and so forth. So this is just aspects of health that we're not used to talking about when we talk about climate impacts on health. I also want to highlight this actually using salmon in an example is that when we're talking about um, climate change impacts of health in ecosystem health that then indirectly impacts our health or sometimes even directly it's that that it's the it impacts the spawning and harvest season for animals and for the fish there is less fresh water for instance for salmon to go upstream and lay their eggs but at the same time we have uh, increased ocean levels of acidification which impacts not just uh, fish but it, it, fish fish are, fish and all the seafood sea, seafood sea animals in sea are in that water, water 24 7. and if we think about how little changes in our protected mammalian system that keeps temperature pretty nice and acidity uh, is pretty stable how just tiny pH differences make a lethal for us humans and make our own survival impossible. 
what that means when we are having the the 24/7 around the year pollution and contaminants but also the the different temperatures changing that animals are comfortable with and adapted to so um In addition to those changes, what I wanted to highlight is that uh, climate change impacts do not happen in a um, vacuum. They do not happen to a pristine environment. And I am not talking about any of these in detail, but their links are at, on the slides and you will get the slides afterwards. But these are the observations that elders in First Nations have been saying for a long time that they see the impacts in local environments as a worsening water quality recession um, along the river, shifting bird and caribou migration patterns, patterns and many fish showing deformities and, and, and so on and so forth. So when we have an environment that is already compromised, when we start having these massive changes that impact reproduction even to a higher extent we are start we start seeing impacts on our food systems that are very very different than what we are used to and and i don't want to sound like a gloom and doom here it's it's just the part that i think it's very important that we when we start addressing the problems these are we need to understand what we're dealing with and the complexity of it in a way that we can create that new way of thinking that is needed to actually find solutions. And um, I want to introduce you this little one unexpected finding in my doctoral research that, uh, that actually got me into working on climate change from studying children's environmental health and chronic disease and low dose pollution connections. Because when 2012, there were these massive uh, rainfalls in Wales and Wales is in, in the UK and Wales is old mining country. And even though there are historic mines and they were closed, they made, there was so much water that it made the tailings overflow. And that overflowing water in silver mining tailings contains so much uh, lead that it caused, uh, when it was measured, it caused cattle to die and get sick in on the fields underneath and there was when it was measured it was 82 times the acceptable toxic level for lead and i just want to highlight to put that into a context when we're talking about children's environmental health and brain development and 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 that type of things neurological development there is no safe level for lead so we need to start thinking much more complex in climate change and and for instance resource extraction context and and industry and, and urban development and storm waters the, it all is happening in the same space it's not an isolated incident that can be tackled without looking at the whole picture so from gloom and doom i wanted to go a little bit more on i'm talking about the different worldviews and it, and talking about trying to to get those people there who are not familiar with indigenous worldviews. There is no one single worldview. Every community is unique. There are different traditions, different stories. So there is not, nothing generic out there. But in general, there is the understanding of of relationality, of seeing and understanding in some way and seeing the land and the other living beings in it as relatives and and that you have rights but you also have to balance your rights with responsibilities that this good relationship with your environment and environment in itself is a problematic word because it doesn't it's sort of outside but meaning that we are in that in that nature we're part of that nature and um and see that when you see somebody as your family and relations, your relationship changes to that uh, 
and it's no longer a resource. It's not a natural resource that you're just utilizing. And in, in, as a biochemist, again, I'd like to point out that evolutionary theory and Western biochemistry are not are very much supporting uh, that view in a way, but that's a personal perception and that's up, not everybody uh, interprets it the same way. So what I want to highlight in this is the big difference in how you approach or approach the world around you is that the current dominating narratives that we tell ourselves are seeing human beings on top of a pyramid top of that whole chain the pyramid whereas the ecocentric worldview that is more similar to the indigenous worldview sees the relationships sees us as part of that um, system and as dependent and the mutual relationships so um, what I wanted to say, point out here is that if you ask any First Nations uh, community how they, what makes their community healthy, you do not hear them talk about the number of glasses of wine they drink, like the public health is measuring what, uh, or, or BMI. They talk about family and community connections and health of the land and access to traditional harvesting and ability to make their own decisions. And I am not, <clears throat> this is more than communities. It's just integral part of the life. And this particular slide is a modification of, um, from the climate change and health toolkit of indigenous health indicators, because in the Swinomish nation, which is a Coast Salish, uh, tribes south of um, the border in the US, but just south of the border. There's um, Larry Campbell, who is an elder, and Jamie Donatuto, who is a, a toxicologist. They discovered the disconnect between the indicators that the public health is using and, um, and what the community, what was meaningful for the community the about 20 years ago and they've been working since to develop these different indicators that would make more sense for communities to help build more community strength and resilience to deal with changes and and it has evolved to climate change adaptation toolkit that can be found on the u.s government website but um it's also a good tool for anybody who wants to work on climate change and health uh, in, in indigenous communities and First Nations communities, I want to highlight that in Swinomish uh, Nation, these indicators were um, selected and developed by them, and they are not the same in every community, but this toolkit allows um, communities to work and develop their own health indicators because health is so dependent on the cultural context and the environment and traditions in that are in um, in um, any community and i want to point out here that that traditional food plays a huge uh, role in health and well-being and it is not just the nutrition it is it is part of the identity it is part of the social fabric sharing food it is much much more and it's not ours to determine or mine to determine what and how and what its role is. I just want to highlight that it plays a significant role in this and in, in, in indigenous First Nations health and also in um, the way we that we need to think about when we try to find ways to do climate change and health adaptation. And I have I did hear a little slide about the language that that is more familiar for public health people out there it's talking about social determinants of health. So it's a very important that we find ways to use language uh, that resonates with um, the communities we work with, but also that you then translate it to the way that is understandable for um, your work and can be used in there. <clears throat> 
in this particular presentation, I didn't want to talk too many. This is high level, so I didn't want to talk too much about um, statistics, and in particular, because our statistics oftentimes are just focused on risk and vulnerability. But because of the food, I think this is really important. This is from the First Nations uh, Food, Nutrition, and Environment study that was 10 years and, and assessed and mapped um, water and food quality, what people eat. Uh, it actually monitored and measured what contaminants um, and both nutrition and contaminant content <laughs> of the food and water, drinking water, as well as uh, took samples from uh, community members to assess um, how much toxicity um, was in, I think it was in here. Uh, and the conclusions were that traditional food is of superior nutritional, nutritional quality. It is significantly uh, more nutritious than the commercial food that is available in communities as well as it also demonstrated that people actually uh, it wasn't as in most cases it wasn't it was there was no contaminant risk in a way that people had any, any kind of detectable levels um, of contaminants in the samples the other thing that is key here that uh, is to highlight that um, food security is an issue uh, Forty-one percent of First Nations households on reserve in BC are food insecure, and yet um, the traditional food access is reducing. And ninety-one percent of the people would have liked to have better access to the to the traditional foods. And to, just to highlight one more thing before I move on is that. Um, uh, two more things. One was that um, uh, this is from my work elsewhere, and I, I know that uh, even the most urban First Nations in BC, people tend to report regular eating of traditional foods, up, like 75 to 80 percent of the people still use traditional foods because it is, as said, it is not just um, food, it is part of identity. And, and in that context, when working with people, food security is more than just having the access to foods. Uh, it's also managing and being able to govern your own food sources. So indigenous food sovereignty is something that is, is um, worth uh, paying more attention to. It, it's, it means that people have also are empowered, they have a power over the resources where they are getting their food. And then I'm getting to the impacts, the long-term impacts of uh, lack of access to foods in, uh, in, in, in First Nations communities. And as said, there is the nutrition aspect for health impacts of obesity and chronic diseases because we need the nutritious food. There are the contaminated food and medicines and there are infectious diseases which is a huge piece in climate change impacts. It's that uh, we, we had that um, little um, not epidemic but we had the little crisis on here in Vancouver Island uh, when suddenly the herring eggs uh, contained cholera virus even though it wasn't the cholera virus bacteria it's not virus bacteria that cholera strains that um, caused um, caused the, the traditional cholera the, it still caused some diarrhea and other discomfort and uh, could have been much more disruptive. And it's that it's it's algae toxins that we know um, ha are causing problems uh, in acute toxicity. And then there is the chronic diseases. 
And I didn't mention it, but the Doha that I'm re referring to is the developmental origin of health and disease, which is something that is emerging uh, an in improved understanding of our health and how early e exposures to low dose contaminants or nutritional intake and social uh, influences impact late development of diseases later in life. Uh, so there are epigenetic changes in uh, caused by this either positive or negative impacts in early life and that those changes can be causing multi-generational chronic disease influences, uh, outcome changes and or they can uh, trigger cancer later in life, a cancer and other diseases later in life. They are associated with uh, um, both neurodevelopmental neuro issues as, as attention deficit disorder, autism, as well as, um, as various uh, uh, chronic diseases um, and conditions and Alzheimer's. Then there are the loss of identity that climate change influences. And uh, there is um, the whole cultural social fabric associated with the food and the grief and depression and mental health. And then there are the socio impact pathways that are there because people are often dependent on various sources of nature, be it tourism, be it food, be it wine country, be it growing wine. And, and that's not traditional food as such per se, but what I'm referring to is, uh, is the impact on, on foods in general. Uh, so before we get into the stories um, of indigenous leadership, I also want to highlight that climate change and indigenous right in Canada play a critical role in all the conversations of climate change impacts on health. And the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights, specifies actually uh, indigenous people's rights in a way that it relates to this more holistic uh, attention to uh, understanding of health. And that goes way beyond um, the Canadian Constitution and Article 35 that talks about Indigenous rights and title. And what makes this in particularly critical and important here in BC is that we now have the Bill 41, which is BC being the very first province in Canada that actually makes the decla puts the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples into a, a real law. So when we are going to address and work with First Nations, um, this is a actually very central piece in the way we approach climate change and health adaptation because it highlights community rights of First Nations to the healthy environment and to the traditional practices and the productive capacity of lands. So now as I've talked a long time, I'd like to have that little pulse of che checking out where you guys are at and if I'm totally out to lunch. So please answer and uh, Katie will, Kate will share, share it with me. Just started Pi V. I'll give you an update in maybe 20 seconds. All right, so the results are interesting. I knew about half of it already has 29%. A couple of interesting new insights at 28%. Most of this is entirely new territory for me at 22%. I knew a lot, but this is helping me generate the big picture at 20%. And 2% said, not nah, old news, better come up with something interesting soon. But 2% is a quite low statistic. It might even be only one person. So 
Well, thanks for that. And I am glad there is some, it's actually, sorry for the persons who already know all this. Uh, I will talk about some other stuff that might be something that you already knew. No, I'm also pleased to hear that there are people who know. Uh, and, and thank you. I'm glad to hear that this can be a little bit useful for you. Um, and I, because now I'm going to work move on to the actual the implications of understanding the whole thinking about the whole uh, health um, on impacts of climate change in a more broader way and what can we do about it and i started the introduction originally to to this um webinar uh, if from the point that the way we frame our research the way we tell our stories what we focus on impacts the outcomes that we get from anything that we do and working as a health promotion and our health promotion climate change and health specialist uh, for indigenous communities because that's what my work is on i'm my role is to support the communities and and strengthen their capacity um, in addressing this but more than that, I think that the rest of the uh, rest of Canada is starting to change the narrative, understanding that the original stewards, despite the negative uh, vulnerabilities and and uh, all the ongoing colonial um, impacts, we is starting to understand that there is something more profound that First Nations can help guide us through. But at the same time, when working as a health, for instance, as a health professional with communities, we have plenty of these vulnerability studies. So maybe rethink the part that do we need more to state the obvious of the colonial impacts and trauma and the disruptiveness of uh, socioeconomic inequities and in in inequality and maybe start focusing on new horizons we need to know the 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 weaknesses or soft spot or vulnerabilities in everything and we need to understand how the climate change work and the health risks but how much do we need to focus on establishing the status is needs to be balanced with the actually what can be done so here as stated over and over again every first nation has their uh, own stories here is the one from the coastal peoples told by Hiltzuk, um members frank and kathy brown and it illustrates that health and in the con health connection to the land and and, and illustrates in one perspective and one uh, cultural perspective of how uh, the stewardship and the relation relations to the land uh, are vital to the health and how the traditional knowledge is important along the side with the western knowledge and here is just to hide a nation youth together with um, Thurn Greta Thunberg demonstrating their concerns. But what I wanted to see here is that uh, the latest IPCC reports last year have really brought up the attention to the importance of um, and value of uh, indigenous uh, worldviews and, and knowledge. Uh, the one that was published in June uh, demonstrated that statistically uh, the areas in on the globe in the world where indigenous people are actually governing the areas are significantly healthy and less impacted and damaged than those areas that are governed by non-indigenous people and then in september they came out with another uh, statement that pointed out that maybe 
we really need some uh, guidance for that, how to run things sustainably. And we can learn that possibly from First Nations and indigenous people. And, and we can see that these conversations are starting to change. And it is, it's a mindset that is needed to, um, to start thinking, what does that mean in your practice, in my practice, when we are working in and with First Nations communities? And I apologize for the indigenous partners and participants in this talk that is just targeting so much uh, communi communities working and people working with you. I hope that this is still giving some language and useful ideas and stories and inspiration. So elders have been, what I hear when I work with people is, is, and, they are, and communities is that, is there any funding that is actually to taking to the next level? We know this already. We have, elders have been telling us, we have been studied to bits and, um, and we would like to take action to lead this to something more. And this is just news from um, Coast Chimishan uh, nations that have now, for instance, is an illustration how they really have committed to doing something about this. And it is this the starting point that when we are looking for ways where we can strengthen capacities, it's maybe going to the communities and ask where they are at instead of uh, developing, this is for the researchers particularly, there is significant leadership and action in, in, B, in Canada and in, in BC and North America. So here is the toolkit again that I mentioned from Srinamish Nation that is accessible. I, and there is climate change and health adaptation funding that I will talk about a little bit later. And then uh, guardians have been stating that there is a climate emergency and uh, and I have concerns about that for a while and I'll talk more about their program later. So there's plenty of stuff going on, but before I get there, I just wanted to bring it together again, this that when we're talking about climate change and health here, we're talking about very much nat uh, natural resources, food sovereignty, um, quality and quantity and healthy land and cultural practices and so on and so forth. This one, there are a lot of models. This one is the FNHA model that I just wanted to bring back together to the topic that I'm talking about. That's why indigenous leadership and stewardship that is essential for most of the cultures, if not all. And uh, it's, it's very values-based there. It's for collective good. It's intergenerational responsibility and it's that relationship aspect. So these are the things that I just want to bring in here. And as I repeated, every community is different. When we start working with them, ask them, ask what they need, ask what they know, ask how you can be a partner and, and, at, and serve, at service. Uh, one of the things that in climate change and health and in health community, healthy community development in particular, and this is not even new in, in any ways, it's uh, McKnight and, and Kretzmann talked about asset-based community development in 1990s. But, but First Nations are also leading by example and comprehensive community planning is a good example where people can uh, have been working with strength-based and asset-based needs and assessments. So communities are often familiar with this approach. It's actually um, fits well with the worldview and mentality. This is from Tunaha Nation when they developed their community, um, comprehensive community planning. This is funded in BC um, and done in many, many communities, also outside of BC for that matter. but. Um, if you want to hear more about this approach and particularly this story, Fraser Basin Council, there's a link, uh, has information. Uh, and here is the, the St. Mary's Band Administration. You can see it in the picture. 
I work with Denny uh, Clement, who, who, and if anybody wants to hear more about this story, it's in the uh, uh, Adaptation Canada 2020. Uh, we have we're doing a workshop that involves this in context of climate change because climate change health assessments and plans and needs um, to make them effective need to be connected to the strengths of the community and what is already there. Otherwise, they remain standalone as a lot of projects that are done in uh, First Nations communities regrettably have been. Another aspect where Indigenous leadership can be shown is, is the traditional ways of and practices of doing things. And the previously I mentioned the, the controlled burning that has been studied and has been done. Clam Gardens is another example. Uh, there was this study in Haida which showed that they, they have demonstration at least for the past 3,500 years. And uh, along the coast, there are various, both south and north of the border, uh, are communities that have been um, starting to develop uh, this type of structures as a as an alternative way for commercial um, fishing practices because there and and to find other ways of of adapt to the climate change changes so there are other concerns that may come and these are the things that we need to think about is the clam reproduce how is how are clams going to react to to the water changes but these are the things that we need to think about when we are working with one another collaboratively. Because climate health is so much about um, more than health, it's more about resource uh, governance, it's also more about um, adaptation and mitigation, it's very complex. I just wanted to bring a couple of examples of fantastic leadership in BC. There are a number of them, and those of you who don't know it, uh, you will feel free to get in touch with me, but, and I can connect you with people um, if needed. Kanaka Bar is, 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 is a nation that has significant, have done, has conducted significant planning vulnerability assessment. They have multiple plans over uh, that, that they are working towards to create an engaged youth. It's a good example of a more systemic approach to addressing climate adaptation in a community. And, uh, and Chief Patrick Mitchell is a, is, is a known climate leader, indigenous climate leader. But it's just one example of many, and, and the good way is what we are trying to develop at FNHA in this climate change and health adaptation connect context is also creating the network so people can connect with one another. Uh, solar panels are a good example, like in, in both in Sauk and Silkotin. I'm sorry, my pronouncing everything wrong right now. Um, it's it's one aspect of its mitigation, but it's also adaptation that impacts health in, in because it's a, it it provides uh, income and resources for the communities. Another leadership example that I wanted to highlight is the Guardian programs, and why I highlight this is that this uh, they just had two day, two years ago got uh, first. It's just 25 million, but across Canada, guardians are indigenous -based, community based organizations based and uh, rooted in tradition and using Western and often, not always, but often Western and traditional knowledge to monitor uh, the environment and what is going on. And the uh, federal government has funded the pilot project. We, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a model from Australia and it, it really could be something or is something that um, works together with climate health adaptation. So when we're building on capacity in communities, this is one of the examples where 
um, leadership is already there. We just need to connect across different uh, Western disciplines and, and sectors to start creating some more systemic solutions. Of our work at uh, FNHA, um, this is an example of a project that we have just started. We got funding for this from Health Adapt Canada, and uh, we are actually looking for communities to work with. Um, so uh, this is about self-harvesting self marine foods that is the traditional way of harvesting because there there are all these risks that are increasing because of climate change but there is the the traditional harvesting is not commercial in most cases or it's a small commercial but when it's not commercial it falls outside of our legislation and 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 the structures that actually monitor its health so we are in the process of developing a, together with the communities that want to work with us uh, mechanisms that communities can actually work with existing western data and their own observations to identify and and monitor the health of the seafood and this project actually emerged from community meetings um, where coastal communities together had a workshop and and brought this up it's um to bccdc and fnha that there really is a need for, to develop this type of monitoring. So this is an example of multi-interdisciplinary plus transdisciplinary in the academic way is that it takes all kinds of different ways of knowing and brings it together and makes it doable for, and meaningful for communities. And, and that, that helps protect public health both in the communities and also outside. And then I wanted to mention, I mentioned the Climate Change and Health Adaptation Program, which is um, in our case also known as Indigenous Climate Health Action Program, CHAP. Um, we fund community driven projects and research that strengthens community resilience related to climate change and health. And if you're interested in getting in touch with me, this is, there's an explicit focus on climate health and youth engagement. Uh, you, it also requires incorporating traditional knowledge and, and strengthening uh, the skills and knowledge in the communities and, it, and, and, and we are asking it to in, be integrated in the existing plans. This funding, by the way, exists also outside of BC, but in BC it's con controlled, uh, controlled, managed by uh, FNHA and, and it's up to 100,000 per year per project and some of um those projects can be found also online uh, that have been taking place up in north of 60 and some of them um are also outside of bc but this project criteria and specifications are for the communities in bc the last but not least there are two aspects I want to highlight, and one is co-governance and policy. And this is to think about when we are addressing this kind of complex situations, um, and I talked about the different, finding new ways of addressing things, I'm using the Cowichan tribes and, and Cowichan watershed board as an example of something that is focusing actually on the health of the water but it's a new model where the, the region, Cowichan Valley Regional District and, and Cowichan tribes have created uh, this watershed board that governs uh, the watershed. And it's co-chaired by the, the non-indigenous and indigenous uh, chairs. And the whole board is about half and half of representatives from both areas plus in addition the board has invited or invites uh, government representatives to be part of uh, the board and they have to be approved by all parties so this is one way of uh, of governing uh, in a way that is also takes this is like health takes health into consideration 
in natural resource management context. And considering that's my background, that's why I focus on so much on it. But it is that um, that has significantly changed the way the watershed is governed. And there are different working groups that have representatives from both indigenous and non-indigenous. And, and the worldview is recognized as a, it's also officially recognized in the governance manual and as, a, as recognizing the rights, indigenous rights and title to the land. And that's unique in the terms and relatively unique. There are other ones too in Columbia River and so on and so forth of similar structures. But the point here is that this makes the governing very interesting from a perspective that Cowichan tribes actually are very urban community and the most of the land is privately owned. If I remember it right, it's about 15% that is not privately owned in that area. So it still, it, it, it creates this opportunity for non-indigenous and indigenous work together in a way that benefits the, everybody. And I see this kind of approach is very critical for the climate change and health adaptation. These are new ways of trying to find ways to improve and protect our health and, um, and also uh, help if make the, makes the adaptation and mitigation processes more sustainable long-term and effective. To get there, however, we need to start thinking about the approaches differently. And this is um, an academic paper and I'm, uh, that actually zoomed in on it and pulled in all the key pieces. And it states that we should start thinking about how our decision-making structures for health in general recognize the indigenous knowledge and the rights and create that integrated system and employ these community-based approaches and circular and holistic viewpoints because that is what really impacts health. It impacts health, empowerment impacts everybody's health, but in this particular ca case, in indigenous health, in climate change context, it's really vital to have that self-determination and collaborative approaches so that, that uh, there are some positive outcomes that we don't keep repeating the same colonial patterns that don't seem to be working. So this was my long talk. Um, I'd love to hear questions and, uh, and any discussion and critique for that matter. Thank you. Ivy, thank you so much. That was incredibly interesting and I enjoyed myself so much. Um, so we have a number of questions. Um, for those who are wondering if it will be posted online, yes, um, we will be posting the recording and the, uh, the PowerPoint online. Um, start the questions with, so Pivy, you mentioned the developmental origin of health and disease. Would you be able to go into that to a little bit um, deeper extent? Um, it would be good to know how deep, because it's something, um, it would be easier for me to provide more materials, but it is, it's what, what happens is that the developmental origin of uh, health and disease is, has been studied for actually more extensively over the last 30 years. And one of the good example was, um, and so the idea first, First of all, the idea is that um, what we are starting to understand, and it's been studied epidemiologically and um, molecular biological level, is that um, in the developmental phase of any living beings, basically, this is valid for, this has been studied in pesticides impacts on, and, and, and on frogs and human impacts of different kinds. Uh, but um, on a biochemical level, the low doses uh, influence um, sometimes in developmental phases more than high doses because our metabolism and development is controlled by hormones that operate in very low concentrations. 
and I hope this is not too biochemical, but the point is that um, the toxic cocktails, and it's the easiest way to think about it is cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoke has a lot of uh, different toxic compounds that individually wouldn't necessarily cause that much havoc. But when, when you're exposed to a lot of uh, toxic compounds, we know that it's start and, 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 and the low dose even in singular matters. Influence it, it, it influences the mechanisms that control the development. And there are different types of biochemical changes that I'm not going to in detail here because that's just distracts from the topic. But the point is that negative impacts are in child, and this is also for animals, and this has been studied in animals in nature. Um, it influences epigenetic changes that uh, create different kind of uh, pathways so that is associated usually with as I listed the diseases that we know even diabetes 2 is of, uh, oftentimes associated with that but the, the point is that um, the post nutrition and toxins compete with the same of the same pathways and so the nutritious foods, such as traditional foods, um, uh, and and they impact in a positive way, and and then also counteract the negative impacts of chemicals, and and uh, that has also that that is also some of the studies that have recently come out, and so this is a topic where I could talk for hours. But I hope that helped to understand a little bit. It, it, those changes are such that the changes happen early in life and something else later on can trigger. And um, that's why we talk about the whole life um, lifespan when we're talking about endocrine disruption. Um, and we're talking about um, also there are some studies that indicate that it could be even in multiple generations but that this is a maybe a little outside of the topic of this uh so if anybody's interested they just I, my email will be later so feel free to get in touch with me if you know want to know more there is um this is something by the way that cihr is right now funding both indigenous and non-indigenous studies because it's recognized that it is really important so hope that answered a little bit thank you so much uh, so our next question, for the Marine Food Safety Project, are you seeking local government partners? Once we have identified uh, um, the communities, I am sure that the communities are interested in having a collaboration with the local government surrounding. This, we are just, just doing a pilot project with this funding. We have only two communities and we hope to expand. We have applied for further funding to expand it further. So uh, as indigenous health in general is a very much of a dependent on, on communities that are either living with or sharing the environment, I am sure that local governments uh, will be part of it. Uh, at the same time, I want to highlight that our research is very community driven and so it would be communities who make the decision. So far, I have not seen that they wouldn't want to be doing that. So I foresee that happening. Awesome. All right, so the next question, for the Tunaha Nation Comprehensive Community Planning, um, are you able to tell us a few of the strengths and assets that were identified and if they were linked to climate change and climate change actions, what, what those might have looked like? So I don't want to be speaking on behalf of Tanaha Nation, so I keep this very generic and apologies for that because it's probably not what you're looking for, but I am happy to connect you with Danny who can tell you more about that if you want to. Um, I um, Assets where basically in the terms of, of uh, assets were identified where assets in traditional knowledge, what is in and what is known and, and assets were as, as in focusing on the capacity of the youth that 
and these are very generic and I'm because it's not my story to tell and uh, and also assets were identified in general what is the strengths in the community that are already existing and then where and, and, and envisioning where the community wants to go and then building on that and when that assessment was done it wasn't focusing on climate change but my understanding is that now it is moving to the next stage uh, where they are looking at climate change and that's unfortunately all that I feel comfortable of, with sharing. That's great yeah thank you and uh, yeah we can if there's information available online in follow-up emails we can um, link to that information um, so that people can delve into that a bit more. Another question, what are recent projects that have been funded by the FNHA Climate Change and Health Adaptation Program? We just started. So I, 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 may I add one thing to the Community Co Comprehensive Plan is that there are multiple of them and the toolkit is online and there is funding available for it to my understanding. So. Uh, there are ways to to combine things when we start looking at it more holistically, and a lot of most many communities have already conducted that. So they the community that you would be working with would already know if they have it or not, and if they're interested in having it. But the tools are strength based, so the toolkit that is available is actually useful for also uh, ad adapting to climate change adaptation. And our funding is. Um, I got hired a um, little late uh, last year, so we are first setting up our program and uh, it will be launched uh, this spring in its full glory because we are also going to have, um, as I said, we're going to have an, uh, like a community of practice, we're going to have a, a webinars and newsletters in general about climate change and health. Um, adaptation and climate change and health impacts and environmental impacts because you cannot in our view you cannot separate the resource extraction and contaminants and climate change climate impacts it's all one uh, we have funded one project in northern uh, uh, bc and they are just starting and it is uh say and um they will be I, I won't be talking about on their behalf either it is on uh, food security and youth empowerment it's, it's the same the topics that we require and it is a multi-year project where they are working with their school and uh, community and scientists great so next question um so i know you talked about fishing in a different way in order to um stop fishing salmon species that were not um, that were not being sought in the fishing. Uh, do you, have you heard of any other ways to adapt um, for climate change impacts on salmon? I can't say anything on the top of my head. I, I am in the process of developing a a resource library online where I would be connecting that type of information. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, I can't really now think of it. it. Could be my after talking for over an hour monologue um, that it's just skipping. But I am more than happy to share uh, if that. Uh, send me an email and and once I come across that, I will share that information. And um, like I said, we're going to launch, we just hired somebody who starts working on it. So we are, we are creating a website where all kinds of links will be available. Wonderful. And yeah, it, it has been a lot of talking for you. So that's totally understandable. We can do follow-ups for that information. And so one quick question, and um, Elena has already recommended a resource for this, but one attendee was wondering if you have any suggestions on where to level rise data sorry i you cut off so what was the question if i have yeah. any source yes for sea level rise data that you would suggest i would i i am suggesting to getting in touch with the pacific institute i actually now i karen 
I could again provide that information, uh, but they actually have fantastic data, and they have. Uh, it, it, are you looking for for indigenous and non-indigenous both? Uh, the the this institute not picks but the other one and I'm sorry now this is this is because of the, all the talking but yes. uh, there there is a resource center at the University of Victoria that has all that data and they have one in, uh, they have one person in staff whose role is to work with people to get that data and and share and train so uh, and her name is Karen. Great. So, yeah, and I think uh, you're referring to the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium. Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there's been a note. Um, Trevor mentions that that would be Kari Tyler. Uh, so if anybody yeah, would like to get in touch with her. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. No. Don't don't be. You got you got it very close. Um, all right. So I think that that ends the webinar. Um, Thank you so much, Paivi, for taking the time to come and have this very uh, comprehensive overview of this topic and answer questions at the end of um, a very long presentation and still be able to do so well. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And thank you as well to everybody who joined us. Uh, we had nearly 200 people uh, join us today. So thank you as well for taking the time and asking your questions and being present for this. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. And I hope that we will see here a lot of Indigenous presenters telling about their stories in the future. And I'm more than happy to connect them with you. I agree. I think that would be a wonderful next step. So we will, we will connect and find some new presenters. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thank you.